All right, great. Thanks, everybody. So welcome to the August NUG monthly meeting. Um, so today, because we have a lot of content, we're just going to um, do some announcements first and a little bit of trivia to get everybody warmed up for the topic of the day, which is about DBS, uh, best practices for reading and writing files. Um, so let's jump in. As always, please feel free to raise your hand and speak up uh, or or just speak up. Um, we have the Slack chan the Slack uh, space if you want to put some content or uh, ask questions, that's a good place to do that. So some announcements. Remember, a lot of these are in the weekly email. So if you are wanting more information. In fact, if you want any links, the best place to go is the most recent weekly email. Um, and so the first one is that the ERCAP, which is the Energy Research Computing Allocations Process, so this is how you would ask for time at NERSC, um, that is going to be due October 2nd. Um, the, the request will be accepted through October 2nd. Um, and if you want more information, we're going to be hosting a like how to prepare an ERCAP, um, which I will talk about in a moment as well. Um, so if you want more information first, I would say go to, to the weekly email, look at the links provided there, um, but then you may have another opportunity, which I will speak about in a moment. Um, the other announcement is that the uh, new E4S stack is available. Um, and so if you want more information, please take a look at Again, the weekly email has more information about all the software packages. Um, another really important announcement is that the nominations for the 2023 NERSC Early Career uh, Achievement Awards is open. Uh, you may have seen an email about that, uh, but if you didn't, um, you can probably try to go find it, or you can, again, see all the information in the weekly email. Um, there's two categories. There's a high-impact scientific achievement category and an innovative use of high-performance computing. Um, the information about what that means and what qualifies is uh, in the, um, I think it's, I mean, it's definitely in the weekly email, but the, also in that dedicated email that was sent out by Charles a couple of weeks ago, probably. Um, the eligibility for this is that um, you need to have used nurse, nurse resources significantly uh, in your work and any nurse user who was a student at the time of their cited accomplishments um, or receive their degree after this date is eligible. Um, so the nominations are due by Friday, September 8th. Um, I, I don't remember for sure. I will double check. Um, I think self-nomination is actually allowed now. Um, I think in the past it wasn't, but self-nomination is a really good way to make sure that people's contributions are being noted. Um, so if you want more information, please check out the email. Um, sorry, does anyone have any questions so far about any of this? Okay. Um, so this is uh, the first announcement for this year's NERSC annual meeting. Um, so this is sort of like our big user meeting for the year. Um, it's going to be fully hybrid, but in-person attendance is welcome. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry. Um, it's going to be September 26th to 28th. Um, any uh, questions about the actual meeting, feel free to contact me, but here's some sort of the, like high level information about what's going to be presented during that meeting. So first of all, we're going to have some presentations from the DOE allocation managers. So if you're interested in that ERCAP process and you want to know more about what are kind of the upcoming priority areas, what are the allocation managers looking for, um, coming to those presentations is a really good idea. Uh, we're going to have technical tutorials. So these are open to um, everybody, but they're kind of meant for people who are doing some more of the hands-on work at NERSC um, who are interested in learning about the API. Um, and then also we're going to have um, a, a company called Xanadu. They, ha they have a quantum computing simulator software, I think. Um, and so they're going to do a really hands-on tutorial with that. We're also going to have a ton of user talks. Um, There'll be lightning talks, there'll be contributed talks. Um, so come find out what all what amazing research everybody's doing. And then uh, we'll also have sessions on how to submit an ERCAP. So that's what um, I was sort of alluding to. If you haven't ever prepared one or if you have and you just sort of want some updated information, you can come to that session. That'll be by Richard Gerber, who's going to talk about how to prepare that. 
Um, we're going to have a session on how to make the most of Perlmutter. So this will be kind of an interactive panel session. And then we're also going to have a session on the integrated research infrastructure. Um, and so you will get probably lots of, uh, well, not lots of, but you will get an email that has the link to register um, and the website uh, where, where all this information is available. So keep an eye out. This is going to be a really great event. Um, Sorry, so I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, lunch. Is lunch confirmed? Lunch is confirmed. Okay, that's all. You, oh, you for the meeting? Yeah, there yes. will be lunch. Yes, there will be lunch provided. Um, we have a working lunches every day, which is lightning talks. That's how the DOE um, allows us to provide meals as if there is uh, a working lunch. So if you come in person, um, if you, you have to make sure to register so we know you're coming so that we can... Uh, order lunch appropriately. Uh, yeah, it's an important, important piece of information. Um, there is another uh, sort of like user annual gathering, um, the ESNet gathering called CONFAB. This is happening in October. So um, please see the weekly email for the re that registration link. We are also hosting our new user training. Um, this is so far, it's been something that happens about once a year, but um, hopefully start to do that more often. Um, if you have new users joining your groups or um, you yourself are a new user, please feel free to attend um, and you can register for that as well. Uh, there's an ideas um, ECP webinar on simplifying scientific Python package installment and usage that's coming up on September 13th. And there is an AI for scientific computing bootcamp, which is in October. Um, so here, so there's some other events. You can go to the events page or in the weekly email for all those links. Um, and then lastly, the uh, applications are open for the Better Scientific Software Fellowship Program. So this is a program that gives people um, some incentive, um, aka funding, to help them um, be able to dedicate time towards uh, some kind of software engineering or uh, software uh, development endeavor. Um, and so if you're interested in that, um, please feel free to take a look at that. Um, but that is now open. Um, and I guess I forgot to put what the closing date is, but again, um, you could probably Google this or look in the weekly email for the uh, information about that. Okay. Are people ready for some trivia? Um, this is supposed to say not so trivial trivia. I think it autocorrected. <laughs> it's not so trivial trivia. Um, all right. So feel free uh, to put your answer in the chat um, and uh, we'll see what people are thinking when uh, we do some trivia. So the first question is, what does DBS stand for? Am I, am I supposed to call out the first person in the chat that does it or? No, no, we just let people populate chat with all of their their all of their guesses. Yeah, go for it. Whatever you think it is, just drop it in the chat. I'm I'm really sad that the donut visualization service didn't make the list. Yeah, that's true. I thought that would be a little too obvious. It was, I, yeah, that that's what I would wish it was. It's the donut uh, 3D printing service. <laughs> Okay, we see some A's and B's. No one went for C. I love acronyms where they took random letters from the middle of the <laughs> word to make the acronym. <laughs> okay. You can work for it when it's like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So yes, the answer is B. It stands for Data Virtualization Service. Um, the visualization service was was meant to be a little tricky, um, but it it is not visualizing data, it is virtualizing data, which I think we will probably learn a little bit about later today from Lisa. Okay, the next question is, what should you avoid doing? Um, I can't, actually, there's a Zoom thing in the way, so I don't even remember what I wrote, but I think it's, it, what, what should you what avoid? What should you avoid doing in order to get the most performance out of DVS? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. There's a, there's like a one of those immovable Zoom things in the way I can't. <laughs> well, by Zoom. Hmm. 
Now this looks tricky. Actually, now I've lost track of which one was for the first question. We should have put a, a mark in the chat, <laughs> which was the oh, question. I think I think Brad had the first response. Okay, I see. Okay, okay. Okay, wow. So everybody says D. Great. That's great. I didn't put a a, a trick a trick in here. Uh, I think every pretty much everyone said D, right? Or no, Heather said A, I think maybe. I don't know. Um, Is that for this one, Heather, or the last one? Oh, sorry. I give the answer away, but uh, <laughs> if you said A, B, or C, you're also correct. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that is also right. It's just that all of these are good things to avoid. Um, but uh, it, you're you're right. If you said A or B or C, those are individually also correct. <laughs> um, so great. Okay, awesome. Thanks everybody for playing. And I will now pass it on to Lisa, who will tell us more about all of this. Um, if you have questions about any of this, Lisa is going to be a great person to ask. Um, all right, Lisa, go for it. Okay, I'm sharing. Sure. Is it still sharing? Yes, you are good. Okay, great. Okay, so hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Gerhardt. I'm in the data and analytics division and AI division of NERSC. Um, I was also, I led the user integration effort during the Perlmutter acceptance process. Um, and I'm the user point of contact for file system issues. So today I'm here to talk to you about DVS and talk to you about basically best practices for reading and writing files around DVS and, and at NERSC in general. So um, I'm sharing my whole screen, so it's gonna be hard for me to see, but if, if someone could let me know if there's questions, you can feel free to raise your hand or, or hop in. Um, so, um, you know, I just wanted to remind everyone of sort of the general setup at NERSC. We've got Perlmutter. Um, we have a whole bunch, and Perlmutter has a whole bunch of really great stuff, a bunch of great GPU nodes and CPU nodes. And um, But for this talk, I, I prefer this view of NERSC, um, which is sort of the hierarchical view of the, the file systems that are mounted on Perlmutter. Um, and, you know, we, we it is a hierarchy because, um, you know, we, we have a trade-off between performance and capacity as you go down the stack. Um, you know, at the top, we have our super fast scratch system. It's very quick. Um, we can get here our numbers up as high as six terabytes a second out of it. Um, so it, uh, it it can really, and it's got, it's backed by all flash uh, behind it. So it's very, it's very responsive. Um, but we, it's lim pretty limited capacity. We only have 35 petabytes. Uh, that's basically the same size as what we had on Cori, and we've expanded the computing quite a bit for Perlmutter. So um, the ratio of, of available space to computing is going down is is pretty small. Um, but it's great for good I/O for fast I/O. Um, I mean, at the very top is memory. Uh, but I'm assuming that if I, if you're listening to this talk, you have stuff that you want to keep permanently. So you know, you use memory when you can when you're computing. When it comes time to write out, you know, there's Scratch as your first choice. And then after that, we have our community file system. Um, that's our big capacity file system. It's intended for sharing um, data with projects at NERSC and uh, at, with the public at large over the web. If you have a large web repository, it's going to live on community. Um, and then moving down a bit more, we have our HPSS tape archive, which is huge. Um, we've got 300 petabytes on there. We could expand it out. And we have, we do expand it out as needed. So there's a huge amount of capacity there. Um, but of course it's very slow because it's tape. Um, and then we have sort of uh, outlier, they're more like, I call them like helper um, file systems. There's global homes and global common. Homes is the place you end up when you SSH into the machine. That's where you start. That's where things like your dot files, SSH config files live, maybe a few helper scripts, things like that. Um, and then there's global common, which is a place where um, it's, uh, it's all flash SSDs and it's designed and deployed on our systems to support software stacks. So it's made to support many small files, lots of repeated reads, those sorts of things. Um, so that's sort of the picture of where things are at NERSC. Um, and I just wanted to start this talk with some general, this is gonna be about DVS, this talk. Um, and I'll talk about more what that is later for those of you who don't, um, who don't know this. Um, but the general advice for IO, at NERSC for reading and writing files at NERSC is um, if you're running on a batch job, you should go to Perlmutter Scratch file system. You're gonna get the fastest rates. 
um, the slowest, the, the fastest internet paths, the sorts of things that's optimized for reading and writing from the computes for our batch system. Um, so that means that includes things like input data. If you're, if you're reading it, a bunch of data, um, things like configuration files, output data, like if you're reading or writing and doing a lot of IO, um, your best bet is to put this on scratch if you can. And I know that there are some folks who can't, we'll talk about those a little later. Um, and then the software for your batch jobs um, should ideally be in a container. At this point, I think you'll get the best results and the most repeatability if you can be in a container. But recognize that's not, you know, it's not always easy for users to do. So we have this the global common file system um, and you can access this at NERSC at global common software and then your project name. Every project gets a directory in global common. Um, we start everyone with a small quota but it's it's pretty easy to get that expanded. Um, so if you if you find that too confining, just open a quota increase request and we'll work with you. Um, but this is where things like if you're doing a installing a conda environment that should go in global commons. If you're planning to run in the batch system at scale, it should go in global common. Um, pretty much anything that you install with config make cmake, um, and you're not planning to like sb cast to the nodes or it has a bunch of libraries in it, that should all go in global common. Um, so if you're doing these two things and these two things work for you, uh, you're great. Good job. <laughs> so congratulations. Uh, but if you're doing anything else, I think you should pay attention to the rest of this talk because you're going to be interacting with the DBS um, mounts of the file systems. And that has a little bit of a different behavior. Um, so it, like I said, it doesn't matter how things are mounted. Let's coming back to this diagram. Um, I just want to point out the, the file systems that are mounted on the computes by DBS. Um, so our community file system, the global common and global homes are all mounted via DBS on our computes. Um, and so DBS is, is new on Perlmutter. We were doing um, native client mounts before this, um, but we switched to DBS a little while, short a couple months ago, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, so if you were using these file systems before on Perlmutter, um, using CFS, maybe you're reading reading data out of CFS, maybe you had a conda install in your homes or something. Um, since the switch to DVS, um, you may need to change some of the things you're doing when you're running at scale. So what is DVS? Um, it's basically, it's an IO forwarder. It was developed uh, maybe 20 years ago, well, maybe 30 now, uh, by Cray. Uh, we've had it on our systems for a, a, quite a while. We had it on Cory and Edison um, and Hopper and all the systems for as long as I've been at NERSC and I'm sure before that. Um, but basically what it is, it's a layer of gateway nodes that mount the file systems and then they directly I they forward the IO um, to the computes and the gateway nodes are situated inside the, the HPC network um, and have are set up to communicate and cache the information very quickly and efficiently. Um, so, like I said, Perlmutter DVS recently went live on Perlmutter. It went live on during the maintenance on June eighth, twenty twenty three. So, you know, just a few months ago, um, we switched on DVS. Um, and just this is only on compute nodes, you know, because uh, for the login nodes where there's only forty nodes, those are all mounting these file systems in the in, in the native way with their native clients. They don't use DBS. So logins don't use DBS, computes do. Um, and like I mentioned before, the one the file systems that do mount this are community, global common and homes. Um, so why did we make the switch to DBS? Um, primarily it was for stability. Um, so the community file system homes and common are delivered by a, a kind of file system called spectrum scale, it used to be called GPFS. Um, it's it's a really great file system. It's very very reliable. It's great for doing lots of I/O, lots of um, reads and writes and lists, and it can it can push bulk I/O. It can do big reads and big writes really quickly. It has a lot of great qualities, um, but it's not designed to run in a situation where you have many many clients with potential network bottlenecks between them. Um, and so we were finding ourselves in a situation a lot of times where um, spectrum scale was <clears throat> the communication between this, the computer and spectrum scale was having issues enough that spectrum, whenever that happens, spectrum scale says, hold on, we need to wait until we get this figured out. Everybody stop. 
until I can figure out what's going on because it's very important that it not drop any data, right? We don't want to lose any data. So it's prioritizing keeping this data. And so when anytime there was a slowdown or if a node went into an unusual state, like a we call like a zombie state where it's not responding quite properly, um, Spectrum Scale would ask everyone to hold. And so what this looked like on the user side was you know a pause when you go to list a directory on the login node it sits there for 10 minutes and doesn't do something you go to close you're editing with vi or with emacs and you go to close and it just sits there and doesn't do anything or when it opens you get a blank screen and doesn't do anything um, so there was a lot of really frustrating pauses on the user side while the while things were rectified and then on the lot on the compute side for batch jobs this showed up as as job failures or much longer than expected job run times things like that um, so we switched from running the native Spectrum Spale clients to, to running DVS on June 8th. Um, and the way this is set up at NERSC, um, we have uh, 24 gateway servers that serve as the DVS servers. Um, each server is configured to handle a thousand IO threads at once. And normally these things are just like bip, 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 and go right through it. Um, so this is generally enough. Um, this is sized to be enough to handle the IO load um, at NERSC. Um, and another advantage of DVS is that um, it can it can aggressively cache data. So if you're doing something where you're reading like uh, the same LD library path every time, you're reading the same config file for this thing, or you're reading pieces from the same chunk of a file over and over again, that cache is really going to have a dramatic improvement in your performance, especially at scale. Um, and we actually have, we offer our file systems over over DVS in two different ways. We have them in the read-write mode, which is sort of the traditional mode. You can read from the file system, you can write to it. Um, it looks just like, you know, sort of like a regular interactive file system. Um, and then we have a read-only mode where all you can do is read, you cannot write to it. And the reason why this matters is the way that DVS handles this. Um, when you're doing a write, when you allow writes, um, just like with, G with Spectrum Scale before, you have to be really careful to not lose any data. Um, and so the way that DVS handles the way that a server is assigned is different for the read-write mode versus for the read-only mode. Um, so for read-write, um, when a file is created, it gets its gateway server, and that's like its forever home. If you are, if you are accessing that file via a read-write mount of DVS, you're always going to go through, for instance, gateway three every time, no matter what compute node on you're on, no matter what time of day, no matter where it is. Um, we also keep the caching really low um, so that if you write to that file from somewhere else, you're going to pick it up. Um, versus read-only, um, that file, if you try and access it via the read-only point, um, you could get any one of those 24 gateways. It's going to give you whichever one is the least lightly loaded. Um, and then there's a cache, uh, both on the client side and on the server side, that will keep that information right there on the notes. You don't have to go all the way back to the file system which you know, is generally fast, but if you're doing that 64,000 times, those things really add up. Um, so those two different mounts have two different sets of behavior. Um, and right now at NERSC, by default, if you just use the, the regular like slash global, com global blah, blah, blah path, um, you will get the read-only mount for global common and everything else you will get the read-write mount. Um, but for, for these file systems, we also have twin read-only mounts that you can use for everything if you change the path a little bit. And I'll talk more about that. So if you want the read-only behavior, you can just use a slightly different path and get that. So how do users, how do folks interact with DBS? Um, you interact with it two ways. First, you interact with it, you can interact with it intentionally if you're using, reading or writing a file on CFS. Um, like I said, some people have for instance, really large data stores, um, you know, they have a petabyte of data that they're doing analysis on. They don't always know which file they need in there that's going to be somewhere in there. And it's too costly to stage that up all up on scratch and keep that up to date. So, you know, their data comes in from an external source, it lands on CFS, they do some analytics, and then maybe it goes to HPSS and, and those things. So they work with the data on CFS because of the size of it. Um, it's also included with that are, are things like config files or startup files or sort of things that you would keep with this data set so that you can kind of know and understand it and, and read it in. Um, and then the other way that users intentionally interact with um, DVS is by using global common. So anytime you're using a module, 
um, and there's installed module, you're using something on Global Commons. Um, if you've installed software on Global Common, then you and you source that you're using you're using DBS. Um, but there's a lot of ways that users unintentionally interact with DBS. Um, so for instance, if you have a conda environment and you install it just without changing anything, by default, that's going to go in your home directory. And then, for instance, if you have something in your doc file, like you really like this conda environment and you want to have it loaded whenever you log in, which is great. You know, it's it's there and it's set up. Um, but then you go and submit a batch job that's maybe doing something else. It's going to grab that whole conda environment lookup thing that happens in your home whenever you start up and drag it along with your job and do that at scale when things start up. Um, and, and for sometimes some folks, they want that kind of environment, some people don't. Um, so it's sort of an unintentional consequence of having this there and set up. Um, folks also tend to default to doing a software install in your home. Like you're just trying something out, you put it in there. You know, there's things like scripts. Um, sometimes you can have hidden dependencies in your software that, that end up calling things into your home. They're just not, it's just not obvious. Um, the same sort of thing happens with, with CFS, you know, because it's a shared space um, and it's a little older than global common, some groups tend to put their software stacks there. Um, and so you'll run into a problem when you try to use this at scale. Um, and then there's also things, just hidden configuration files and dependencies. I think that's true for any file system. It's very difficult sometimes to see all the, the web of dependencies that uh, programs have when you run them. So I just Lisa, want to talk a little, yeah, go ahead. There's, there's a quick question in the chat. Um, Brad's asking, should you not write to a file through rewrite and then try to read it immediately through read only? So read write has, um, yeah, that's generally you want to avoid doing that. Um, you want to avoid using read only for things that are being immediately written. So the cache right now for read only is I believe uh, five minutes. So you'd want to wait for that cache to flush out, which I think is kind of, because it's a little tough to get the timing right, we generally don't advise you using the read-only not for something that you're actively writing, to, just to be extra safe. But what I think you would end up having, you know, what you would end up with is there's a chance you might get the old file, right? And not get the, the new information that's in there. And so I think that's, in general, that's undesirable for some people. Some people may not feel that that's that much of a problem. So because it's it's easier to understand, we we don't recommend doing that. Yeah, I, I had that suspicion. I just wanted to confirm and then make sure that everybody else got that understanding as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank don't, you. Don't, don't assume that read only is the faster reading from something that your process is writing to. <laughs> Yeah, it depends. What, so, so, you know, if you have like a fixed data store, which is a lot of the folks that we've sort of seen run into these problems, they have a big set of data and that data is not changing. You know, if they're coming at it through read write, they're going to have a, they're not going to have a good time. So those are the, the, if you have that kind of thing, we definitely want to steer your choice by read only for sure. So let me give you an example, sort of what this looks like. Um, so we have two different kinds of loading behavior going on. So this is the first, this is sort of the good, this is what you should do. So you have a job, it's a hundred node job and it's using it's, it's using a conda install that's been installed in global common. Um, and you're running, it's on CPU. So you're running 128 procs per node. And so when it starts up, all 12,800 processes of these are spread evenly across the 24 DBS servers. Um, the file that leads to your conda environment is fetched once on the DBS side and then it sits in the cache. Um, and is quickly read and the job starts right away. Uh, and if we contrast this against the behavior that we get um, if a conda install is in home, um, same 100 node job, the only difference is conda installs in home. All these processes line up on this one DBS server um, and wait to fetch this file. And then each process has to fetch it fresh, um, again, from the file system. Um, and what you see is that the load you can see here, these, these lines are the load versus time on our DBS servers. Um, the load shoots up to a thousand and it just stays there. Um, and the entire job is sitting and waiting for this single DBS server to kind of finish processing its load. Um, and as an addendum to this, um, up until just last week, when this was happening, every other user that tried to use the service node also had to wait. 
um, because it was doing a first in first out for IO requests. Um, so, which is really basically undesirable. It was at the point where we would have to reach out to this user who's really not doing it. It's kind of natural to put Conda in your homes. It's not, you know, they're not deliberately trying to cause this problem, but it would cause basically what amounted to a center-wide outage on the computes um, because this was happening. So this is really undesirable behavior for DVS to do this. Um, so we worked with our vendor to change the scheduling al algorithm. And as of the 16th now, there's something on there, it's, it's called a fairness algorithm. So what it does is when things start to get really high, instead of serving in a first in first out, it'll cycle through all the users. So maybe you're sitting here with your 100 node condo thing pegged at a thousand just waiting and it's gonna say, and then someone else comes up and says, I just want a single file please. And they're like, yep, here's your file, go ahead. And it'll keep everybody else moving while it slowly churns through this backlog from this one. So it's it's an improvement in that one user's behavior is no longer adversely affecting all the other users, um, but it's still something, you know, your job will be slow. Um, so it'll be better if you can move this conda install or whatever you're using off of the read write on, onto these read only. Um, so, okay, so what should you do? Um, so I think we kind of kind of covered this in parts, but I wanted to put a summary slide in here. If you just want to read from CFS, you have data you're not changing, you just want to read, you can use the DVSRO path instead of global. So if you have something that you know, goes global CFS, Cedars, your project, mega important config, you just change out this first part, it becomes DVSRO, CFS, Cedars. And then you're getting the read-only one. So if all if you're running a thousand node job and they all want this config, it's going to go super quick. And if you want to run Conda environments at scale, um, our first recommendation is use a container. That's always going to be better. Um, but if you can't do that, use Global Common. And there's some instructions on our webpage about how you would get your Conda installed to move to the Global Common path. Um, and then there's a few other things that um, kind of like, these are more like edge cases that you want to avoid. And one of the things, another place where folks run into trouble a lot is if you have an ACL for DVS. Um, ACLs live in the extended attributes part of the file which unfortunately forces DVS to go back to the file system and look something up. And so ACLs tended to defeat any caching that might happen even on a read-only system. So if you, if you avoid ACLs as much as you can, if you're trying to use ACLs to share things with different groups, we can do things like create a custom group and you can have subsets belong to different things. Um, so there's, there's ways we can work around it. If you're finding that you have a big data store that you want to read over DVS and you need an ACL, like open a ticket and we can work for a way to find something that will work for that. Uh, so I, I think that's all I had for today. I just wanted to kind of point out that, you know, this work is ongoing. Um, you know, we, we are always trying to make the IO experience better. Like I think that um, DVS accesses have improved quite a bit over the last week and hopefully you guys feel the same. Uh, but I know that there's still some work that we need to do there where we need to investigate why sometimes things are a little slower than we want and we're actively working in this area. So if you have any questions about what I talked about today, if you see any unexpected results or performance, you know, always open a ticket. Um, it's always more data for us. It's always helpful. Um, and I think that's that's all I had. Oh, I thought that was really great, Lisa. Thank you. So your real applause. <laughs> um, I, I had one quick, quick question real fast. Um, the ACLs, is that like making Unix groups and giving different permissions to each one? Or is there like some other common examples of ACLs that I would help me understand a little better? Usually what I see folks using ACLs for is like they have a, a group that they want to share with like one or two other people. And so they'll add those in as an ACL rather than, you know, maybe they don't want those folks to have access to the whole directory or something. But it's, it's fine. Okay. It gives people fine gain control um, mm -hmm. for directory access. Um, this is Howard Pritchard from LANL. I have a question. Can folks hear me? Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, this is very interesting and very timely for us with our problems with Crossroads. What is the deviant? So you mentioned this fairness algorithm. Do you know, is that a patch to DBS is, or is that uh, something that the vendor has released with the new DBS, like RPM updates that we should try? So that 
that as far as I understand, it's not nurse specific. It came to us as part of their um, their cost bundle, which is where DBS is delivered. Um, so I think that should be something that they should be able to give to other sites. You may have to, if you're, I'm, I'm not sure what you guys are using, if you're using costs under the cover COS or if you're using something else, you may have to ask specifically for it. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Lisa, there's one more thing that came up in chat. Um, there's, there's been some discussion about it already, um, but maybe you would like to weigh in or, or, or not. Um, but they said, the question is, are you supposed to use a DTN, a data transfer node, to transfer from scratch to CFS, or is a login node OK for a few terabytes? Um, I think I my answer is Globus is always easier because it'll retry for you and keep going, and you don't have to keep your, your, your thing open. Um, there's nothing. For a few terabytes, probably a login node is OK. If you're talking tens of terabytes or something really long running, um, you need to start being, you know, you're going to get, you likely might get interrupted. And also, um, you just need to be sharing the node well with others. So I'd recommend Globus in general. Um, and I see there's something about the difference between global common and home. Um, yeah, so homes is. Um, Homes is basically intended for just for um, like minimal environment setup scripts at this point. Um, if you have a software stack and you want to run at any scale, um, I think Global Common is the place for you. And the difference right now, they're both backed by um, Flash, which is much faster than spinning disk. Um, but the, um, the size of the individual the, the block size on Global Common is is optimized for software installs, so it's a much smaller block size, and it's got the read only by default mount on the computes. So those are the that's what the advantage Common has over Homes. And I forgot to mention this in my talk, but when we're talking about scale, it's not just one job of a thousand nodes. If you have a thousand one node jobs, it's going to have the same effect. Um, so just think about this when you're submitting lots of jobs, um, you might get a light queue day and all your jobs will start at once and the same thing will happen. Thank you so much, Lisa. Were there other questions? Um, did all the questions from the chat get answered? If if you ask a question in chat and it got lost somewhere. Please feel free to unmute and ask your question now. Okay, any parting thoughts? Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Lisa, for your wonderful presentation. Um, I think Hopefully that will be really helpful for everybody. Um, we will be posting uh, the slides and the recording of today's meeting um, on the website. So if you miss something and you want to hear it again, you can always go check it out and feel free to um, email myself or um, Charles is usually here. He's not here today. If you have any other questions for us, but uh, hopefully see you next month for the annual meeting in person. Or, or remote, it's totally fine. <laughs> but if you want to, you can attend in person. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Libby. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you.